Hello art friends, my name is Anusha Said, and I'm a children's book illustrator and character designer for animation. I've illustrated over 20 picture books with some of the top publishers in the world, like this one, this one, and this one. And today we're going to be talking about picture book covers and how I illustrate them. People always say, don't judge a book by its cover, but let's admit it, the cover is usually what makes you decide to pick up a book, especially if it's a picture book, and especially if you're a kid and you can't read, so pictures on the cover are kind of your main deciding factor. As an illustrator, it's kind of my job to make sure my covers are enticing enough for someone to pick up from a bookstore shelf or click on a website. But apart from it being an appealing design, it should also give the reader an idea of the story your characters, and what you're about to read. I previously made two separate videos on how I illustrate chapter book covers for older kids and middle grade, and I included links below. But I realized that I never really made a video on illustrating covers for picture books before. I do touch on them in other videos, but weirdly, I've never made an entire one dedicated to it. I do feel like I approach picture book versus chapter book covers pretty differently because they're four different um, age groups and they require different process and planning. And so obviously it makes sense to make a new video for the topic, which is what we're doing today. So we are going to be going over my process and how I plan and illustrate picture book covers, starting from the brainstorming to character design to sketching and then the final art. I'm going to include all of the timestamps below so you can skip ahead if you need to. And the focus of the video today is the book That's Not My Name. As some of you already know, I wrote a book. My author illustrator debut is coming out next year on July 12th, 2022. It's called That's Not My Name, published by Penguin Random House, and it's my first time writing a book, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys. After months of keeping it secret, today I finally released the book cover on Instagram, and here is how it looks. Ah! To celebrate my cover reveal, we're going to look over how I illustrated it. Also, I did make a video a couple of months ago talking about how I got my picture book deal and the process of writing this book, um, creating the book dummy, and then submitting it to publishers. That video has a bit of background information that could be helpful before watching this or if, you know, anyone's interested in how the publishing process works. So again, link below to watch. Also, if you're interested in supporting my work, um, if you're a fan of my work, or if you were thinking of buying the book anyway when it comes out next year, consider pre-ordering it. Pre-orders are so, so, so important for the success of a book. When you pre-order a book, it tells bookstores that people want this book. So then they stock more copies of the book, which of course means that more people are going to see it and buy it. I'm going to include a pre-order link below, and if you do decide to get it, Thank you guys so, 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 so much. It really means the world to me. But anyway, enough shameless self-promotion. Let's get started. So a little background information on the story itself. That's Not My Name is the story of a little girl called Mirha. Her parents and her grandma who live with her have said her name properly, perfectly all her life. But, you know, when she starts her first day of school, she realizes that no one can get her name right. Even her teachers say it wrong. One classmate even suggests that she should change it to something easier for everyone to say. So then, poor little Merha, she becomes insecure about her name until her family reminds her that it's something to love and to be proud of. It's a story that I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to and I feel sends a really important message. I mean, being called Anusha, it's a book that I really wish that I had as a kid, and that's why I wrote it. I talk about this more in my book deal video that I mentioned earlier, but to sum up the entire process. Two years ago in 2019, I wrote and drafted a book dummy for That's Not My Name. This included the entire manuscript in its final draft, all of the interiors sketched out, and two spreads illustrated in full color. Funny enough, I actually did not include any artwork for the cover, no sketches, no nothing. I didn't really think about it. But anyway, with the help of my agent, we submitted that dummy to a list of publishers and my first choice, Penguin Random House, got back to me with an offer and I got a two book deal. With my editor, Anika Kalia, we made a couple of edits and improvements to my manuscript and then I was handed over to my art director, Jim Hoover. Since the sketches from my book dummy, I mean, they were pretty much fully complete and ready to go already. Apart from a couple of notes, we moved straight to final art. Once the final art was done, we were ready to work on the cover and now you're all caught up. 
Of course, since this was an author illustrator book, um, this process was pretty different from all of my other projects where I only illustrate other people's work. I do want this video to be helpful for illustrators on both sides of the track, so I'll explain um, that process a little bit as well. Side note, this is my experience with traditional publishing. I don't have any experience with self-publishing, so unfortunately, I don't really have any information on that, but I hope that this can still be helpful. Other side note, there's construction going on. I'm really sorry if that audio comes up. Anyway, when I illustrate other people's work, what happens is that an art director or an editor will contact me. Um, contact me or my agent asking if I'm interested in illustrating a book that they have in the works. They'll send over a description of the book, maybe the full manuscript, um, the schedule, and the offer details. If I accept, after a bit of negotiating and like super boring contract stuff, I'm introduced to the art director and it's time to get to work. At this point, it can go um, one of two ways. Depending on the project, sometimes I'll be asked to illustrate the cover right at the beginning before starting anything else, and sometimes I illustrate the book cover after I finished all of the interiors. And there are pros and cons to both of these options. If you're asked to illustrate the cover at the very end, which, is, which has been my experience for most of my books, you have a lot to work with, which is great. Since you've finished the book already and you've spent a lot of time on it, you've kind of perfected the character art, the style, the color palette. Um, I mean, like, you've done it already. So when it's time to actually do the cover, you don't have to do too much exploration for this kind of stuff because the visual aesthetic has already been established. You're also able to directly reference specific scenes from the interior, or you can include like little Easter eggs onto the cover since you know exactly what the interior looks like and you can reference off of it. However, when you're asked to illustrate the cover at the very beginning, uh, which was my experience for the books Rise Up and Write It and I'm Perfectly Designed, in my experience, I feel like this was usually for marketing purposes. Uh, essentially, they want to get the cover finished first so they can promote the book as early as possible. The downside to this is that um, you have no idea what the interior is going to look like, especially if you haven't even started on the sketches yet. So when you illustrate the cover first, you are setting up your style and color and aesthetic, etc. right there. And you can't reference the story because you have no idea what it's going to look like. So sometimes you are forced to design a cover that's a little bit vague in terms of concept. However, once you figure out that style for the cover, it is a lot easier to work on the interior because the work is done already. When I worked on the book I'm Perfectly Designed, I am so glad that I worked on the cover first because it essentially became the blueprint of the entire book. And I actually kept referring back to that original illustration because I feel like it really portrayed what I wanted to do with the book and I would keep trying to recreate that same emotion. So yeah, pros and cons to book. For That's Not My Name, we illustrated the cover at the very end. This was great because by that point, I had illustrated all 32 pages plus the end papers and I knew exactly what the style and aesthetic was. In terms of size and dimension, usually the art director is gonna let you know what size you'll be working with, but because I wrote and illustrated this book, I had a lot more creative freedom and input in the overall design of the book. When I created my book dummy in 2019, I had kind of decided to go for a more like, like a squarish shape, um, and I wanted the book itself to be quite large. Um, I was actually looking at other picture books that inspired me and that I kind of wanted to like emulate that feel. Um, but I think figuring out the dimensions uh, and choosing that depends on the artwork itself and what works best for it. Like for example, if you were illustrating a book with a bunch of landscapes, maybe it might make sense for your spreads to be like more rectangular so you can have a more panoramic feel and put much more environment art into it. So anyway, once my submission was bought by the publisher, the art director made a couple of small tweaks to my dummy and actually changed the size of it slightly. So in the end, my book's final dimensions laid flat was 9.6 inches by 21 inch at 300 dpi, which included the bleed. The book cover was 9.8 inch by 11.6 inch. The dimensions have to be slightly bigger because I was illustrating the dust jacket, you know, that little paper sleeve that goes over a hardcover book, and the art needed to be able to like wrap around the corners. 
For this book, I only illustrated the front cover. Um, in some projects, you are probably going to illustrate the front and the back, and then sometimes you might even do like a long wraparound illustration, which is what I did for I Am Perfectly Designed. If you were to illustrate a wrap illustration, you would normally just illustrate the whole front and back on one canvas. However, for this book, since the design I was going for was quite minimalistic and simple, we wanted to keep the back pretty minimal as well. So um, my art director took care of it. He just picked out a spot illustration um, from the interior of my book and then just used it at the back. So the book itself isn't out yet, so I can't really share like, you know, like hold it up or anything. But recently I got my hard proofs for review. The proofs are like um, the printed out first draft of your book. It's like basically a pile of papers before it's been fully assembled into an actual page train book. It's a way to double check to make sure everything looks okay like the colors and the art, before you send it out to the final printing. Unfortunately, I can't show you the um, final interiors yet because it's secret secret, but um, here is a look at my jacket cover. And you can see the front cover here, the colorful spine, and the back. And you can see that the back really is quite simple um, with a little tagline and then the spot illustration from the inside. Character design. So character design is a big part of children's illustration and it's important to create an appealing and memorable design, especially for your main characters since you're essentially spending the entire book with them. Before starting on the interior art, I had to develop the world and the characters that live in it. As a professional character designer for animation, this is actually my favorite part of the entire picture book process because it's, uh, it's kind of what I'm good at. Anyway, the process for illustrating an author-illustrator book, again, is quite different from being hired to illustrate someone else's story because creative freedom. So like normally, um, you know, when I'm illustrating other people's work, I would create maybe three to five character designs for my main character, and then I would present them to my art director, and then they would discuss it with like the author, the editor, marketing, whoever, and then come back with notes. Uh, maybe going back and forth a few times until we all came up with a design that everyone liked. Um, you can watch this video for a better look into that process. For that's not my name, however, um, <laughs> I drew one single design way, way back when I was developing my book Dummy. Like that was like the first thing I did. Um, I drew that one thing, looked at it and thought, yep, perfect, this is it. And this design just stuck. So this here is the first drawing I made for my book in 2019 of my main character, Merha. And then two years later, when I started to work on the illustration, um, the design did evolve a, a little bit. Um, her head became a lot smaller, um, her boots turned into little loafers, but apart from that, the design stayed pretty true to my initial concept. When designing my main character, there were a couple of things that I had to keep in mind. So I had already decided at the very beginning that Mirha was going to be a South Asian girl like me, around six years old, not like me. Um, I wanted her to look super, super cute, like someone who's playful and really cute and shy. Um, since she goes through a lot in the book, I wanted her design to have like a strong innocence to it. Um, so that when she's uh, depicted as sad and feels lonely, you just want to give her a big hug. I also wanted to make the design iconic in some way, especially with her outfit. The way that I like to think of it is that if a kid were to dress up as my character for Halloween, would you be able to easily guess who they were supposed to be? So in this way, I decided to give her a cute little pinafore dress um, with those iconic red apple pockets on them. And then this was further enhanced when I went to color. I feel like not a lot of kid characters wear black so I thought that it would look really striking on her. For iconic characters, it also helps to stick to a pretty limited color palette so it's not too busy. Um, think of characters like the Minions or the Smurfs where, or the Simpsons even, where even just two or three colors is good enough to make you immediately think of them. That's brand recognition. I wanted a more mature, kind of muted palette for the book. So for Mirha's colors, I went for black, yellow, and red as her main scheme. Any additional accents on her outfit, like her earrings, her hair ties, or the straps on her buckles, would still incorporate those three main colors so that it all feels pretty cohesive. I do include a teeny bit of green on the apple leaf, as you'll see, but 
you, you'll notice that I made sure to use it again on the shirt collar so that it all ties together and it doesn't feel out of place. Since her pinafore is a flat color, I gave her shirt a pattern, like a stripey pattern, to add in a bit more visual interest and make it pop. At one point, I did consider giving Mirha some colored or patterned tights, but I decided that it would end up looking too busy because sometimes less is more. This is also why I got rid of her little boots and gave her flats instead. So in character design, I don't know if it makes sense, but it can be good to give balance to your shape. Like with Mirha's design, most of the visual interest and attention is on her top half. Starting with her pigtails and her patterned shirt, all of the most exciting stuff is at the very top. To balance it out, I then chose to make the bottom half much simpler so you have a bit of breathing room. If I kept the boots or the patterned tights, I think it would have been too much and made the whole design look too busy without a, like, a strong focus. So with the character design done, let's get started with the sketches. Sketches and concepts. Before making this video, I actually asked my Instagram followers if they had any questions about the picture book cover process. A big question that kept coming up um, was, how do you choose which scene to illustrate from your story? Which moment do you choose to highlight? Now, I thought that this question was really interesting because at least in my book covers, I don't really pick a scene from the manuscript and illustrate it. I find that it might be a bit redundant since the scene already exists and shows up in the interior, so you're basically sharing the same image twice. Instead, I come up with an entirely new concept that is usually quite separate from the rest of the book. And I think that this is a pretty common approach for picture book covers. Um, like here are a couple of popular covers where they aren't drawing from specific scenes from the book. I think that the best approach at um, illustrating a cover is trying to figure out what is the key message you're trying to say with this book. Remember, this is what is supposed to grab your reader's attention, but it's also supposed to let them know what the story is. Usually, the cover is going to be centered around your main character, but what else? Um, can you include any other characters, um, props, background, or story elements that directly reference your story and explain it better? And then depending on the message or the genre of the book, like if it's funny or if it's a serious book, can you design your illustration to evoke that feeling and make it clear? The book A Girl Named Rosita is a biography of the actress Rita Moreno spanning her entire life. Um, so here, it does make sense to illustrate a young and older version of Rita Moreno uh, performing because that is her passion and it's a life story. I also like that the focus is on her pink dress um, because in the book, Rita is actually the only character who wears pink, which really makes her stand out from everyone else. Um, but I also feel it's like a recurring theme of her ambition. In the book, The Little Things, the story is about a girl who saves a starfish and that leads to a series of events where people end up helping each other out. The girl actually only shows up at the beginning and the end of the book, but she is the catalyst for the plot, so I feel like she's really important. So the most important elements would be the beach, the starfish, and the girl. So it would make sense to include all of those things in the cover. As an added bonus, the frame around the illustration includes a bunch of little references to the series of events. Lastly, in the book, I Am Enough, the cover is very simple, but it makes sense for the book. Since it's about self-empowerment and loving yourself, having the focus be just on the main girl and the title, which almost feels like the girl is saying aloud to herself, it sends a clear message on what it's about. Of course, depending on the situation, you could definitely illustrate a scene from the book, if you feel like that particular scene is an important moment of the whole story. I think that the book Parker Looks Up is a great example of this, where Parker looking at the painting of Michelle Obama is the literal most important part of the whole book, and it makes sense for it to be the focus of the cover. Another question um, someone asked was, how do you illustrate a cover so that it looks like it's different from an interior illustration? What sets those two apart? And I think that um, while both are used to tell a story, um, they serve different purposes. An interior illustration portrays an action and a scene that's just on that specific page, whereas a cover is attempting to sum up the entire book in just one illustration. Like I said, you can do this by either determining what is the most important scene in your book and illustrate that, like, you know, the very point of its existence, or brainstorming what all of the key elements are, like the message, the character, the plot points, the aesthetic, and just trying to combine that all into one illustration. 
You also have to keep in mind that the other big, big, big difference is the title. As well as the cover art, the title plays a huge role. And arguably, it's probably the most important part of the cover because it's giving key information to the reader. Some publishers will choose to design the title themselves in-house, but it's still a good idea to plan your cover with the title in mind and try to incorporate that seamlessly into your art instead of it feeling like it's been forced in. For my cover, I didn't pick a scene, but instead I chose to highlight key elements. So since the book focuses on Mirha, um, I wanted her to be the main subject of the cover. There are other characters in it, but I felt like Mirha should be the focus. The other key element is her need to get people to say her name right. So I wanted to figure out a way to portray that as well. In my interior art for the book, I had developed a pretty specific style in visual language. Again, I can't really share the art right now, but eventually when it comes out, you'll see that there aren't a lot of backgrounds, but instead um, it's like pretty minimal and white and instead I focus on character. I wanted to carry that aesthetic to the cover as well, which is why I did not draw any background art. One element that I used in the interior was speech bubbles. They show up a lot in my book as a recurring theme, mostly when people are saying her name wrong, but also when Mirha is expressing herself. I thought this was, this was a really important detail, so again, I felt like I should include it. Personally, I love hand-illustrated titles, and while I don't always get a chance to do them in my other books, uh, since the publisher might decide to do it in-house themselves, um, I was determined, absolutely determined to do it here. Um, because the title is kind of an exclamation, like, that's not my name, um, I thought it would be fun to have the title be part of the illustration in a way, where it looks like Mirha is actually saying it out loud and interacting with it. For the title font, I didn't really do any research for it. Um, the, the font is just a form of my handwriting. Um, I actually also used it for my logo here. Um, so it just kind of came naturally. I just wanted to keep it playful and wobbly like a kid might write it and then have it in all caps to show that it's like a chef. So with all of this in mind, I came up with three concepts to present to my art director. The first one is of Merha in the middle of the page. She is surrounded by speech bubbles all around her and they're all saying her name wrong. Bubbles with Maria and Maya and Mira and Merha's in the middle she's frustrated and she's yelling out, that's not my name with a title on top of her, and then for my title design, I tried to make it like loud and jagged with excitement. The composition here is kind of fun, of course, having like the important elements of the title and Merha in the middle, but then the speech bubbles are drawn around her almost like a frame. My second design is much softer. Behind Merha, again, we see the bubbles saying her name wrong, and in the middle, she's standing, but she has like a sadder expression and then she's facing away from the bubbles. Um, as if people are calling out her name and she doesn't want to acknowledge them. And then to the right side is the title and a much, um, I did like a subtler, set, subtler, <laughs> lower case font um, as if she's whispering it softly. I really like the composition that I did here, contrasting the busy, busy speech bubbles on the left and then the emptiness on the right giving full importance to the title. And then finally, a more confident, triumphant cover, much more happier in tone. Mira's in the middle, crayon in her hand. There are misspelled names all around her, no bubbles this time, but she's kind of crossed them out and she's looking super sassy, like she's saying, that's not my name and I'm proud of it. Again, it's pretty similar composition to the first one, Although looking back at it now, I do feel like there's a bit too much dead space and your eye doesn't really know where to look. So if you guys are interested, here is a little time lapse of my sketching process. I forgot to mention that I work entirely on my iPad Pro on the app Procreate. I've been illustrating all of my books on there, even the sketching process. You can see that I'm only working on one canvas and I just have each cover design on a different layer. I like doing it this way so I can easily click back and forth each design without having to exit out of the page. I start off with a pretty rough sketch and then draw over it one more time a bit more cleanly, but it doesn't get like super clean.
So my favorite concept of the three of them was the first one of Merha yelling, and actually the confident one was my least favorite. I'm a sucker for book covers that are kind of like sad and moody, but I knew that it's not really something that the publisher would want to see, and I had a strong feeling that they were going to prefer the confident cover option since it's much more happier and kind of marketable. <laughs> so my art director Jim, he took a look at all of the options, and then he felt that like a combination of the first one and the last one might be the best option. Where we were to keep the composition of the first illustration with like the bubbles and the close-up of Merha, but we have Merha's sassy, confident pose instead, and then make the title a bit bigger as well. Jim also liked the crossed out names in the third option, and then he asked if I could include that in the revision as well. I was a little bit iffy at first because I felt that might make it a little bit too busy, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to try it out. He even sent over a Photoshop image of what he had in mind, which was really helpful as I went over to the next stage. While my moody cover choices were a favorite of mine, I understood that this cover was the right way to go. And as I worked on the final art, I knew that it was absolutely perfect. Also, as you can see, this illustration doesn't happen in the book. Uh, there's no moment in the interior of the book where Mirha is literally crossing out speech bubbles, but again, I'm not really focused on illustrating specific scenes for this cover, but rather I'm just trying to let the reader know what they're in for and what to expect and what the message is. This book is about people getting this girl's name wrong and she's standing up for herself. I think it's pretty clear looking at this illustration, so I think I've done my job. And now we move on to color. Coloring the cover was really simple because, as I said before, the interior illustrations were already done, so literally all I had to do was color pick from my established palette. Illustrating Merha was easy since I just had to keep a reference image on the screen and work off of it. The harder part was figuring out colors for the speech bubbles. I had played around with a couple of different color palettes, but I knew for sure that I wanted all of the bubbles to be super um, bright and colorful and that they should overlap each other in a retro way. For inspiration, I looked into examples of um, mid-century patterns that use limited colors as well as risograph illustrations because I wanted to utilize that fun overlapping color technique. For those of you who don't know, for all of my books, I always create a Pinterest board dedicated to collecting um, references and inspiration for that particular book project. Most of it is going to be drawing reference, like for example in this book, most of it takes place in a school setting, so I needed to collect a ton of photos of classrooms and hallways, etc. Um, but I'll also look at other illustrators if I have some sort of idea in mind, but need some visualizations to help bring my concept to life. In particular, I was researching for other picture book cover examples that have a totally white background with minimal art on top and a focus on typography. So me and Jim had chosen a really gorgeous uncoated wood-free paper for the cover and I liked the idea of a clean white background on that paper because to me it felt like really sleek and retro. But I also wanted to make sure I could get away with a blank background without it looking totally boring or empty. So um, books like Hank's Big Day, All Are Welcome and Another uh, were really good examples of the aesthetic that I was trying to create. And I was able to study them and try to understand why it worked for them and then try to learn from it. Along with the rest of my artwork, I love layering texture and really trying to mimic that kind of hand-painted feel. For most of my work, I use the default brush 6B pencil, which is included with Procreate. But I do use a variety of textured brushes, um, including ones from Max Packs, Nick Henderson, Bardo Brush, and Retro Supply Company. In the end, I had sent Jim four different options for my final art. I didn't really bother doing a color rough stage because the cover was so simple and I just went straight to the final art. If you want to see examples of how I do color roughs, um, I talk about it in my I'm Perfectly Designed video. All right, here is option one. This is a more mature color palette. Um, I don't really use these colors in the interior, but I really like the color combination as well as having white text in the bubbles. I thought it looked pretty stylish, um, and then here I had Mirha holding a blue pencil as if she drew the that's not my name at the top. Option two has the bubbles much lighter, um, going for a more pastel color palette. I had also changed the pencil into a black tip, 
and then I added the crosses over the misspelled names. I wanted the text to be a different color from the scribbles, and so I made the text brown. You can see that I did have a bit of difficulty making sure that the text would still be visible under the scribbles and not be too busy. Option three is a colorful palette. This one uses colors that do show up in the book and I made sure to directly color pick or even copy paste bubbles from my interior illustrations to keep it cohesive. So I had a feeling that this was going to be the winner so I had also sent over two additional versions of this option. One was with white text um, and then one was with black text since I wasn't sure which was going to be more readable on the bubbles and I needed a second opinion. Okay, from this point on, me and Jim went back and forth over the next like week, two weeks I think, making small changes until we reached our final design. Jim agreed that this color palette was the way to go, but he did suggest that we try the scribbles again. So I was worried that the black might be a bit too harsh for the scribble, so I sent over three new options where I alternate between blue and black scribble. For the black scribble, I also changed the title color to match the black, thinking it might tie it all better together. Jim also felt that the title was a little too delicate and could be drawn a bit more bolder so that it reads better. Because the art needs to be extended over the flap, I also had to complete all of the bubbles on the right side so that, you know, they're not cut off. So with all of that back and forth done, we finally settled on this design with the blue title, white text, and the black scribble. And again, if you're interested, here is a full time lapse of the final illustration where you can see me go from sketch to final art and all of the little adjustments I made along the way. In case anyone is interested in the specs of this piece, like I said, it was drawn at 11.6 inches by 9.8 inches or uh, 3,480 pixels by 2,950 pixels at 300 dpi and in RGB. Um, my art director said that he preferred to deal with the CMYK stuff on his side um, and like all of that color profile nonsense because I'm really bad at it. And in any case, I usually avoid illustrating in CMYK on Procreate since lately Procreate has been really weird with CMYK files, so RGB. I used 30 layers in total out of the 61 layers available. I usually don't need that many layers when I'm working on an illustration, especially the simple, um, but this was mostly because each bubble got its own layer, so either Jim or I could easily move the bubbles around if needed. According to Procreate's time tracking function, um, I spent five hours in total illustrating the final art, but of course this does include a lot of starting and stopping and revising, so it's probably like a lot longer than that.
A lot of numbers coming up. Um, on March 22nd, 2021, Jim let me know that it was time to start thinking about cover concepts. On April 7th, I sent over my initial sketches and May 7th, I got feedback from Jim, which included that um, Photoshop mock-up thing that he sent over. My first pass at the colored art was on May 19th, and then on May 25th, um, after all of that back and forth, we finally agreed on the final cover art and it was approved. So, all in all, from March 22nd to May 25th, you know, it basically took about two months to get the cover done. In terms of timing, I was already really, really ahead of schedule with my book, um, and the whole thing didn't need to be submitted in until August, so there wasn't a rush to get it done, ASAP. Um, and I was able to take my time with the art, even though it was a pretty simple illustration. And there it is, my process and how I illustrate my picture book covers. Of course, every project is different, so if you want to see other examples, check out all of my other videos on book covers and picture books where I go into detail on my process for those books, um, especially since those, since they weren't like my author illustrator book, they were a bit more involved and required more steps. As an author illustrator book, I did have a lot of creative freedom on this project, which is why it went so smoothly, so it might not be like the best indicator of how my books usually go. Jim did a fantastic job with the art direction, and I think that the end result looks so good. I didn't work on the back cover, but I think that the route he chose for it looks great, and I love how he incorporated the bubble colors for the spine as well. Um, I made this video in celebration of my book cover reveal, and I also plan on making a full video of my entire process, um, writing and illustrating this book when That's Not My Name comes out July 12th next year. So look forward to that. And if you have any questions about that book, let me know below and I'll try to get to them um, in that next video. So yeah, if you are interested in supporting my work or you are thinking of buying the book when it comes out, consider pre-ordering it instead. The pre-order link is below. And if you pre-order, please, please let me know. Um, again, it really helps with the success of the book. So I would really appreciate it. And like, you guys are great. So like, thank you so much. Apart from YouTube, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. I'm at Foxville underscore art. Um, and I also have a Patreon where I share behind the scenes of my life as an illustrator. Um, and if this video was helpful, consider liking it and maybe subscribe to my channel. Apart from posting videos analyzing my picture books, I also share insight into the illustration industry and how you can build your career as an artist. But anyway, that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions for new videos, leave them down below. But otherwise, um, I'll see you next time. Bye!